Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board certified veterinary dentist and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. Alrighty, from Katie. What's the best way to keep patients from becoming hypothermic? Um, again, um, that's a that's a, a, a good question, and um, I'll talk about that um, uh, once we once we do our anesthesia. Um, but our patients, we have to remember. A lot of these patients are smaller and we're getting them wet um, like she mentions in here the other um, thing we have to remember is they're breathing in cold oxygen and that can um, that can certainly um, drop their temperature as well so um, we really want to be diligent about how we are keeping these patients warm. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, best ways is delivering warm fluids. And um, there are um, fluid warmers available. Uh, we, we don't use one. I, I just... Um, have a little trick of taking the IV line and putting it between the patient and uh, the hot water circulating blanket, which is on the bottom. That's what the patient is resting on. And then in order to cover that 85% of body surface, in order to have good effective thermal support, 85% of that body surface needs to be covered. We have a bear hugger on top. So just having the hot water blanket on the bottom and then just a towel covering the patient typically is not enough. You need to have that heat source kind of surrounding that patient. So my patients are um, covered pretty much up to their neck. Uh, feet are tucked in and a lot of folks will uh, put booties on. Very, very good idea as well. Um, but keeping um, that patient um, surrounded uh, with that 85% of body surface covered, as well as delivering warm IV fluids. Those are probably the two uh, most effective things that you can do to maintain the temperature. And we do have a number of small patients, um, cats, small dogs that are under for two to three hours um, for those advanced perio cases, stomatitis cases, that very rarely go below that, that 99 mark, which is really, really nice. Again, that lends them to um, a nice, uh, quick recovery. When they get hypothermic, um, their recovery tends to be very, very slow. And so we wanna make sure that we're maintaining these patients appropriately. So those two tips will, um, will make a big difference. From Jenna, uh, do we stage full mouth extractions? Um, in most cases, we do not. Um, <clears throat> we are able to, um, Dr. Beckman um, is able to do full mouth extractions typically oh, two and a half, three hours. And again, we're looking at all of our parameters. We're evaluating um, how that patient is doing under anesthesia. We're looking at the blood pressure. We're looking at how the temperature is maintaining. And, um, and so we'll uh, move forward. If we have those patients that, um, you know, they're under for a long time and now maybe the temperature's starting to approach the little lower portion where we're approaching that 97 mark um, and, um, and we're just not able to get that up, I'm gonna evaluate, you know, find out where we are in that procedure. If we're almost done, let's just move on and you know get get them done and and get them you know up and out of anesthesia to to get them warmed up. If we're you know not halfway through with that procedure and that temperature is dropping and we're not able to get it up, then we're aborting. We're going to recover that patient and um, and have them come back and um, uh, be more proactive. Um, 
maybe they were just too deep under anesthesia. There could be a lot of factors why that temperature dropped, but um, we're going to evaluate and, um, and see if we need to abort. But 98.7% of the time, we do not um, need to um, stage these patients. And we've had patients um, that were under the longest anesthetic um, patient we've ever had was just this year, and it was a corgi that had all malformed teeth that were non-vital, and um, some, several were unerupted. That procedure was just shy of five hours, and that corgi was up and, you know, walking and running to the client, to the, the pet parent, um, and we kept that one uh, about an hour and a half, two hours post-op, um, and recovered very nicely. So uh, again, we're monitoring and looking at those parameters um, to dictate, you know, how long that patient can be under anesthesia. From Amber, while in recovery, do you offer the pet food um, prior to being sent home? We don't, only because, again, my patients typically are uh, awake and ready to go home within about an hour after we're done. And so I'm discharging patients um, throughout the day. Uh, I may discharge patients as early as 10:30, 11 in the morning if we have those repeat patients that are coming in for a six-month profi or a four-month profi. And they're going home pretty early in the day, so um, so we don't you know we don't need to feed them in our practice because they're going to be home within you know a little while after. Um, for those patients that are with us and we don't get to till later in the day, um, again uh, they're still going to go home um, and still in most cases be able to eat dinner that night. So we. Um, we typically don't, um, only those patients that stay overnight with us do we, um, do we give food to. From Jacqueline, should pain meds and antibiotics be sent home after extractions or would it depend on the patient? Um, no, that's going to depend on uh, absolutely um, pain medication. Antibiotics we talked about, um, uh, in most cases no because we're clearing all of that. Um, but um, pain medication, absolutely, and depending on what procedure uh, we did. All right, uh, our anesthetic plane, we've got lots of um, questions here. And do we keep the patients light on anesthesia even during major extractions? Um, yeah, we absolutely do. Um, again, we are able to maintain these patients typically one and a half percent. Um, because we've put nerve blocks on board and again we just need them asleep enough just enough to tolerate the tube and um, in a lot of these cases when Dr. Beckman finishes uh, oral surgery on one side and we flip that patient um, they paddle a little bit and we've got to ventilate a couple of times to get them you know back back down to a, a appropriate plane to continue with oral surgery but that's how we like them that's how light we like them and um, and our nerve blocks do a really good job of allowing us to do that so um, as far as your question Nancy as far as the um, CRI of the epaxalin we do not need to do that at all um, we can maintain them with just our, our gas inhalant Sammy, I love this question. How do you feel about a CVT helping with the dental oral exam charting, or do you feel this should only be done by a DVM? I am absolutely on board, as is Dr. Beckman, with a CVT, RVT, LVT, um, starting that dental chart. That's absolutely in the technician's wheelhouse, and, and it behooves you to be able to recognize very obvious pathology. When looking at the x-rays, um, so typically what happens is once I complete the x-rays, I can see where we've got significant periodontal changes, bone loss primarily, where we're going to be doing most likely extractions, and I'm already putting my nerve blocks on board in those quadrants. My next step is to grab the chart, go over to my computer, and start putting that dental chart together because I can recognize teeth that obviously are going to be extracted, as most technicians can who have seen dental x-rays. 
I can recognize tooth resorption that I know is going to be an extraction. And so those kinds of obvious pathology um, are the things that are marking, as well as circling the missing teeth, um, anything that's um, unerupted, all of that I'm going to mark. And then Dr. Beckman is going to come in behind me and confirm all of that. And then I'm looking in the mouth for gross pathology as well because I can recognize oral masses, fractured teeth, discolored teeth, tissue that's not supposed to be there, um, tissue that doesn't look normal, ulcers in the mucosa, all of that kind of pathology, you guys should absolutely be able to recognize and make yourself a very integral part of that dental team in moving that case forward because sometimes in a general practice especially, your veterinarian isn't available. Maybe they're finishing up a spay. Maybe they're talking to a client in a room. Uh, maybe they're on doing uh, finishing up a phone call. And so anything that you can do to move that case forward is absolutely within your skill set um, as a good, effective dental technician. So we absolutely, um, and when I teach my, my students, um, we talk about charting, we talk about pathology, um, radiographically as well as grossly, to set you guys up for success in being that integral part of that team and being able to do that. So um, kudos to you for, for asking that question, and I'm, I'm hoping that you're doing that already. Um, and um, that's, a, that's a huge asset to the dental team. Uh, do we recommend trazodome? Yep, talked about that, absolutely. Um, for those, uh, those more anxious or difficult patients, um, anything that we can do to relieve anxiety. And um, as, a, as a tangent to that as well, um, a lot of times we will have those patients stay with their owners until we're ready for induction. They tend to be um, less anxious. So if there's a you know, exam room or if we're still doing you know, curbside, if they wanna wait in the car, um, and when I book those appointments and those owners tell me, hey, he's, he's really an anxious dog and, you know, terrible separation anxiety, then those guys stay with their, their pet parents and we will try and do them earlier in the schedule if we can. Um, uh, but I let them know that, you know, we would, we would love to have them stay with you as long as possible and then get them back to you as quickly as possible in recovery. So we, we offer that just kind of thinking outside the box, again, making this as pleasant as possible and exceeding expectations to get much better client compliance with these patients. Will an opiate as part of pre-med be acceptable for just prophylaxis? Uh, from Brittany, I can't imagine it would be detrimental if not getting any extractions. Here's the deal, we don't know because <laughs> we haven't done the assessment we can't do the assessment until they're under anesthesia. We assume everyone has some degree of disease and will need some form of treatment. Even if it's as simple as root planing, they're still gonna need some pain management. Very rarely do we have patients come in that we do not find some degree of pathology. Um, it happens. Um, in our practice, doing nothing but dentistry, it's probably happened maybe four or five times in the last year. Um, we, we typically will find stuff. So we assume everybody has some degree of disease. And so our pre-med, um, yeah, across the board, we don't know that it's just a prophylaxis because we are doing an assessment on every patient. For those patients that are coming back for a four month or a six month prophy, a lot of times we're doing root planing, either open or closed. Um, we're cleaning below that um, that gum line. And so they're going to feel that. It's minor, but we still want them to be comfortable on recovery. So we're definitely um, still going to stick with that protocol, uh, regardless of what they're coming in for. Because a lot of times, um, if we assume it's just a prophylaxis, um, we typically will find other stuff. Question from CeeLo uh, on a young pet, pet only needing scaling and polishing. Um, we tend to use telazole. Again, my question is, how do we know? Um, 
at, at the pre-med portion, we haven't taken x-rays yet. Um, and telozole, not my favorite. Again, too much sedation um, because of that, um, that slow recovery. We want these patients up and out of anesthesia and going home, um, wagging their tail and not out of it um, for better client compliance so that we can get these patients treated appropriately and as often as they need to um, under anesthesia. I trust you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed providing it. If you would, do us a big favor and go to our iTunes page, post a rating and review, and take a picture of that with your cell phone, and then post it on our Facebook page, and we'll send you the Instrument Use Essentials course. If you also look below, there is a link to two live trainings that we do. One is on radiographic interpretation. The other is on killer tips for quicker extractions. If you have not been to those, register for the one that's coming up next, and the link will be in the show notes on the website, The Vet Dental Show, and we'll get you in and get you a 30-minute, 40-minute overview of those topics that are really insightful and all take home and then we'll also give you an opportunity to get a great deal and some bonuses on those two courses that are online courses that span uh, five hours and seven hours. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you'll help us out uh, with the post on our Facebook group. And then as a little extra bonus for you, you've got that link down there. You can register if you haven't been to either one of those and enjoy all of that content uh, that we're going to give you on those two topics. So take care. We'll see you next week.